The topic for, for this last session uh, of today is an introduction to automatic calibration in hype. And uh, as a, to stick with my previous analogy, I have now a picture again of the mechanic. And you can, uh, you can, you know, you can have different tools uh, as a mechanic. Uh, and they can be used, useful in different conditions. You can have the hand tools a, s a screwdriver, for example, and if you want to do a real fine tuning, you normally need that sort of touch of your hand. Mm -hmm. And then there's automatic sort of uh, uh, wrenches like this. They are pretty quick, uh, uh, or, or automatic screwdriver. They're pretty quick, and you can sort of take off the wheel or on the wheel pretty quickly, but you need to know where to apply them. You can't just Give, it, give the tool and, and leave it. You need to know where to put it. That's a little bit the analogy here. There are different tools and manual calibration is one like we looked at in the morning. Automatic is another, which you can use in some cases. Okay, don't worry about the analogy so much, but uh, anyway, let's go on. What is the aim of automatic calibration? It's basically to define an optimal parameter value or range uh, that best describes the process. Okay, we tried to do that before with uh, altering this alpha PT. Now you can get a little bit of help by just computa computationally by the, to, to find the, the optimal value. And the basic approach is basically to, you define a quantitative goal, that's called an objective function. Uh, this is normally to simulate an observed variable with the least, the lowest error possible. For example, the, uh, Okay, this, should, this is actually wrong. The maximum NSE, the minimum RE, uh, and so on. Um, you should know, though, that in hype, all criteria are converted so that they're optimized toward the minimum. So you're looking at actually to the minimum inverse of NSE. That's details, but anyway. And then you let the computer try different uh, parameter settings iteratively until it reaches that minimum. Uh, so it runs hype in several cycles, uh, calculating the objective function and then modifying the parameter value in some way. There are different methods for that. And then trying a next run and going on like that. Uh, okay, there are different optimization methods. And essentially that is different ways of looking for those parameter values mathematically. Uh, and that can be using random sampling or calculating the direction as you go through uh, looking at different parameters, looking for where you should go. It can be using a single simulation, just stepping one at a time, or it can be a family of simulations, stepping with several simulations. Uh, okay. This is a large topic theoretically. I'm not going to go through that. This is more of a practically oriented uh, introduction. But there is some material in, what, uh, in that folder under exercises automatic calibration. I put some background material so you can read up some literature and some more explanations and background if you like. So illustrating this a little bit more, if you think about you have two parameters, x and y, and this is uh, some sort of objective function, let's call it RE. You want to have a, a, the lowest uh, uh, absolute value of the, of the relative error. Okay, this is that point if you illustrate it here. So you can uh, define your objective function, that's the crit definition in the info file, and s select one of the optimization methods. There are several available in the, in the code. And uh, this is just an illustration of the path that the software takes to get to that point. So depending on the algorithm, you can have a Monte Carlo that samples the entire space and sort of progressively moves toward uh, the, the lower uh, end, or the minimum. Uh, there's yeah, different paths. It's not so important. But you get there in different ways, basically. Uh, an example, what can happen? This is actually an, an, another model setup, but it's the same case that, that you're looking at for the Swedish case. It's Fellfors, one of the stations. A lot of uh, needle-live forest, we discovered that before. 
uh, sort of a medium coarse texture. In our original European setup, it looked like that if you plotted just observed versus uh, simulated daily discharge, you had a, a, a RA value of a minus four, uh, so 40% under prediction and uh, no, 4%. Okay. And then an NSE of 45. You apply the algorithm, let it run for a while, you get that kind of result, which is good. So it's just a pure mathematical way of finding numbers. It doesn't always work, but, uh, but in this case it worked. Um, some uh, reflections on what is the pro and con of using manual or automatic. I think you can combine them for different uh, tasks. Automatic is repeatable, some, somehow transparent in terms of the methods. You have a defined optimization criteria. Uh, although there are assumptions, obviously, <laughs> regarding those objective criteria, so they're sort of semi-objective. Uh, you can define, you can quantify uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, sen sensitivity. It's computationally demanding. Uh, and there is also a risk of getting a sort of an unrealistic parameter definition. For example, compensating, setting a parameter to an unrealistic value, compensating for another model error. So you, you need to think, if you use it, you need to think about the physical meaning of those parameters that you get in the end, uh, the numbers. Uh, and I would say probably best to only use it to in improve individual components rather than throwing it in and trying to improve every single parameter in the model. That's just impossible. Um, and it's basically assuming that observations are perfect. Uh, they are not. You probably know that. Uh, so you, you could end up in an over-reliance on, on, on observations as well with this method. OK, there's some mathematical issues as well. On the manual side, maybe, I don't know if Jöran agrees with me, but anyway, I think it's a sort of a mixture of objective and subjective criteria here. You look at, you include the model's experience uh, as well. And probably it's easier to handle problematic data if you can see that there's some observation errors, but you can disregard that visually if you look at it. Uh, however, it's less, probably less repeatable, and it's time consuming rather than computational demanding. Time for you or time for the computer? Anyway, a little bit more background on the theory here. Like I said, it, there is, it's available in the folder. There's a documentation on the numerical optimization mm -hmm. algorithms. And there's a PowerPoint, actually, of, uh, of uh, one of the methods that we use, uh, mostly the DEMC. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, that was a very brief introduction. And then now I'm going to go to the automatic calibration exercise, to the exercise overview. OK, reminder again, the portal with all the goodies. Don't forget it. Uh, key files <coughs> that we use here, <coughs> if we start with the input for automatic calibration. You have, for example, observe discharge in the QOBS file. I'm not going to show that. You've seen it all probably already. In a file called XOBS, you can have other variables, like water level, evapotranspiration, or anything, basically, that the model understands. There's a few other files as well, but basically, that's what you can use. Info, this, is, this one is really important for, for automatic calibration. First of all, it, and I've given here three links. If you download the presentation, you get the links to the, to the documentation about this on the wiki. So uh, you have uh, just general settings of uh, activating the, the function, what kind of criteria you want to uh, calibrate against. Is it the median uh, or mean relative error, or is it the mean uh, median Nash Sutcliffe, or whatever? And also a little bit more detail about the the, the equations behind that. Uh, I'm not going to show that, but you can look at that uh, later. Just uh, in principle, the info takes three. What you need to do is you have a, you need to write a line calibration, yes. 
So it means it tells the model that, OK, you want to do an automatic calibration run. Uh, and then at the bottom, uh, last, in the last exercise, I uh, showed several people about the, the, the definition of the criteria. And here, actually, now it's when it's become very important. Because here you define what kind of criteria that is used in the automatic calibration. What is that quantity that you want to minimize? And um, so you, you have to define several things. What's the period you want to uh, uh, calculate over? What is the, how, how much data should you actually accept? There, there could be stations with very little data. Maybe you want to disregard them. Which criterion? OK, go to the documentation to find which one you want to use. Which variables do you want to compare? Normally, we do observed and simulated discharge. And then there's two of them here, two sort of entries, which are almost copies. But the only thing is that, in this case, we use a criterion called MRE, in this case, MR2. And you can combine different criteria as well. So you can have your own combination of various criteria. I'm not going to show that more, but I just tell you that that exists. Uh, however, I would advise you to start with just having one. OK. And there's another example available in the example files under that folder. Uh, OK. The other key input file that you need is what is called optpar. And this defines the, the let's say, settings for the automatic calib calibration, uh, which method you want to use, and what parameter ranges you want to sample within uh, when you look for the optimal parameter range. There's a user manual which shows a little bit more of these screenshots and how it works, also located, uh, included. And a few other notes. I mean, now you have to think that now, before you, you made just one run, but now you're going to ask the model to make many runs. So the run time will, will increase significantly. Uh, remember that, yeah. And then another, that when you do this, uh, all discharge stations which have data for that period and uh, you know, enough data for that period will be included. If you don't want to use that for whatever reason, if you just want to look for uh, forest dominated areas, whatever, then you should modify your QOBs to only include them. Or use the PMSF or selector if you like that. OK. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me. I'm going to show a little bit more now on, on this optpar file. But before that, I'll explain the, one of the methods that is available uh, and how it works. Uh, in principle, it's the, it's the DMC. And that stands for Differential Evolution Markov Chain uh, Optimization. So that's, that's the method. There is many different methods. That's the method that we currently most, uh, most of the time use in Hype. So how does it work? Uh, generally, it's a random walk, so a Monte Carlo walk through parameter space, finding those parameter values by randomly. It's testing something uh, randomly. And here I've illustrated with, uh, um, OK, so uh, step one is that you have a group of simulations. It's called a population. So in this case, I have four, four different uh, uh, population members. You can think of this as one hype run. OK? They have different, each color represents a parameter, uh, a set of parameters. Four of those, we start with four and say, OK, these four are going to, uh, we're going to uh, propagate these uh, several times. Uh, you sample the, the parameter space randomly. Uh, and then you take the next step uh, and you, you define how many times are you going to let uh, uh, try a new alternative parameter set. That's the generations. You have a population. And then uh, the number of times you're going to run this is the generations. How many generations? Uh, that's the sequence length. 
and then there's there's sort of a, a, connect, a connection. Uh, it, you can think of it as a family. You have uh, some parent that generates a family, and there's a lineage or a chain that that belongs to each other, right? You you start somewhere, and then uh, the next the parent of that inherits some characteristics. No, the child inherits some characteristics of the parents. So there's a that. Uh, uh, that's uh, the idea. Okay, how do you then generate uh, new parameter values for the next iteration? Well, it's based on a suggestion of parameters from the from two parents. Let's say you, you have two parents, you combine that, and you get a child. Easy to remember, huh? Okay, and then uh, if you accept that, sometimes. You accept it and you say, ah, yes, we want it. We try that one. Or sometimes you don't accept it. You say, ah, oh, we tried that one, but we don't want to keep it for the next round. OK. <laughs> That's a bit gross, maybe, but uh, don't think about that. <laughs> That's four parameters, OK. Uh, and if you, want to, if you want to accept or not in the future, depends on uh, a, a crossover uh, parameter, basically. Uh, OK. Did I say everything? Yeah. OK. Any questions on that, how, how the general idea is? You start with the population. You're pro progressing. And that is based on what you had before. Uh, and, and sometimes you're going to proceed with a new suggestion. It, obviously, if it's better, if it's performing better than the old one. But sometimes you're proceeding also if it's performing worse, just to be able to try a different direction. Because it might be a sort of hill that you need to get over before you reach another valley in, in the parameter space. OK. Maybe more questions later. But anyway, that's, that's generally the idea. What does that look like in this optpar file? First, the first, I think, 21 rows is about defining what type of task you're doing auto automatic calibration in. In this case, the DE is this method that I just explained. And here you're setting a, a number of uh, input parameters, let's say the population, okay, instead of four, I want 100 in this case. Number of generations, how many times am I going to iterate these? Uh, before I had three, here I put 200, okay, so you see they are increasing a lot. And then the other parameters is, is uh, what I defined in the, in the PowerPoint here. So you set those values as well. And uh, there could be other tasks here, like, so for example, this one, task WA, means that you write extra output, you could say. You write uh, all output from all simulations. And I'll show you what that means soon. OK, that's, that's that section. And then down here uh, is, comes the parameters that you want to calibrate. Um, there's three lines for each, each uh, parameter name uh, because you want to give it a parameter range and a resolution. So you have, uh, for example, here, uh, you have the minimum and, a, and the maximum. So it's going to look for a value between those, that, those values, between 0 0.1 and 5. It's going to look for a parameter value between that in that range at this kind of resolution. And for the same, this is important, that for the same uh, parameter, okay, this, this uh, MacTrimf is soil dependent. So, you, uh, okay, in this case, you want to calibrate soil, the first soil. And you, you're calibrating that. But the third one you're keeping constant, it means that you don't calibrate that one. Maybe you've already calibrated it or you don't want to look at it right now. You just keep it the same value. It means that the model disregards it and run, run with that value all the time. OK, um, now coming to the output files. Uh, some of you have looked at the subas file and the simas file. Uh, this is what you get if you do one run. 
And if you do multiple runs, now you're going to get multiple of these uh, output files as well. If you, uh, yeah, uh, one for each best simulations, I think. Uh, com I'm coming back to that. Uh, the, the file all sim, it uh, contains all the performance criteria and parameter values for every single run that has been made every population member and generation. So in my t t t example, I had four population members and three generations. Four times three, that's 12. Okay, so it should have 12, uh, 12 lines of entry containing the parameter value it has tested and the result in terms of the, uh, uh, that uh, criteria. Best sims, it contains only the ones that is considered the best or the last generation of the uh, of the of the chain here. Not all generations, but the last one, the best one for each family chain, you could say. And this file respar, it has the uh, optimal parameter values that has been the output result. So this is a, a, the values that you would then put in par uh, for that for the optimized. Parameter, and finally, uh, useful is a log file as well, where you can monitor how how quickly the calibration is going. Uh, it, you know, so you see if it's run one or two or ten uh, times. Mm. The regular output files, like the time output files or sub-basin output files, they get a number. Uh, a subscript, uh, which indicates which of the of the best simulation runs that they refer to. Easier to see when you get it, but uh, when you do it by hand. But anyway, that's what, how it works. What's the kind of analysis you can do, or we normally do on this? Uh, here's two examples. Uh, one parameter, another one which relates to evapotranspiration. Uh, and a, a criteria. I told you that we want to minimize, all criteria are set to be minimized. So you want to get at, as low as possible. And having what we call identified parameter means that you've found some sort of minimum where, where it's, uh, yeah, you find a, some sort of minimum. Uh, and in this case, you can see, OK, if we have a, a value somewhere on the negative side, you're getting a high error. If you're having it uh, at a very high value at plus one, you're also getting a, um, an increase in the minimum is maybe between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 in this case. This is an example of a case where we couldn't identify the, the, the value. The, the, the simulations are all over the place. We don't know, are we going to have it over, you know, you choose that value or that value there. There's basically no information about this parameter uh, that we can extract. Or it's not sensitive, perhaps. Uh, you can also analyze uh, the, the sort of evolution of the performance as you go along uh, these uh, several uh, generations of, of simulations. You start by, uh, in the beginning, you have a wide range of, of uh, performance, and then you sort of taper off, and you could maybe say that, ah, in this case, maybe it would have been enough to run with 100 generations instead of 200, because the difference between here is not so much compared to there. But it's not always the same. And then looking at outputs, um, just one, one illustration of a, dis of a hydrograph. Um, so here, what I did was in, in red is observed. Uh, and instead, now you get, you get uh, several best simulations. So not just one simulated output, but a range. Uh, and that range I illustrated by a sort of uncertainty band. So in this case, I think it was five simulations, but whatever number you have and uh, producing then a range of, uh, of uh, performance, 
arranged in the performance uh, criteria, because every single uh, run has a, has a different value. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of sense for what is the parameter uncertainty in this, in this uh, uh, parameter. OK, so now is uh, the exercise. Uh, and it's basically about setting up and trying to understand what is this auto calibration doing. Uh, and then a little bit also on, on analyzing outputs. And I've done just the same like before. So you have this folder if you've uh, downloaded. There's some example files here. So in the info, you can, for example, s uh, check that, OK, I've, I've activated calibration. And uh, I've defined my criteria. And in this case, I'm just using one criterion. And I'm going to use the mean absolute value of the relative error. And I'm using the absolute value because I don't want compensation, uh, compensatory effects of having some stations over predicting a lot and another under predicting, and the average becoming zero. Right? I want, that's why I use the average, uh, absolute value. That was the info. And then in optpar, uh, hold on. So this is a set, setting using this differential evolution Markov chain method having four populations and 20 generations. So I'm going to have four si each, uh, simulations at each step, iterating those 20 times. And there are a few settings f f uh, on that method as well. And then below here, I have defined uh, now also uh, this um, a, a factor which uh, uh, um, scales evapotranspiration for the fourth PET model. It's called KC4. And it's land use dependent. So I have 100, 169 columns here. But as you can see, the first one and the, almost every one is the same. It means that the, I will not calibrate them. I need the value because otherwise the model doesn't understand which one it should, uh, should uh, calibrate, which land use class. But I've actually just defined one. See if I can find it. It's always easy. Yeah. OK. It's this one. It's between 0 0.9 and 2. I'm going to let the model try between those two uh, extremes, let's say. And it's for the same land use class that we found before, that number 32 in this Swedish case. Uh, OK. Uh, and then there's some result files. You can look at them yourself uh, one, when you start running and asking questions on them as well, what they mean. But, but uh, if I just show you the all sim, you're going to have uh, the, criteria, uh, the, the runs, one row per run, and then the criteria that we defined in the info file, calculated criteria. Some other criteria, the standard ones that you get in the subas file. And then also importantly, the, the parameter value for that specific run. And a little bit, which population is this belonging to in the, in the DMC run? Which generation? And if it was accepted or not <coughs> uh, to the next generation. OK. Um, that's the files. And um, so uh, the first thing is basically trying to set up this info and optpar file for you to run the hype and uh, wait for uh, success again. And like I said, it's going to take, depending on what you set here, it's going to take much more time. OK? I think to run the Swedish example in this setting, with these settings, took. Uh, Three, four minutes or something like that. Uh, OK, and then there's uh, another R script where you can analyze the output to, sh to do uh, basically those kind of graphs that I showed. <coughs> 